we're finishing the book of Ruth. I have personally loved studying this. I hope that it's ministered to you. Um, what an amazing story Ruth is. Uh, you know, you, you've got this family, the Elimelech family, the household of Elimelech, leave Bethlehem during a time of famine, and they go to the place that they were forbidden to go to, Moab, running from God for 10 years. And the, the beginning of the book almost starts with this, this mourning, weeping, because it opens with not one, but three funerals. Elimelech, Malon, and Kilion all die. But then we see this amazing, hopeful thing where Ruth doesn't abandon her mother-in-law and they return to Bethlehem. And it carries almost this theme of weeping at the beginning, but in the fourth chapter this morning, we're going to see joy. We're going to see God's provision. In fact, Psalm 30, verse 5, a verse some of you are familiar with, weeping may endure for a night, oh, but joy comes in the morning. See, contrary to what most people think, especially online, <laughs> weeping doesn't have to be the general theme of your life. We carry this, this weight sometimes where it's like we function better when we're sad. It's just the, and you know what, guys? God gave each of you an emotion. Let me just highlight that really quick. God gave you emotion. So let's not deny what God's given us, but there's some of you who have allowed emotion get the best of you. And there's too many joyless Christians right now. There are. In my opinion, and I know each of us can talk for a long time, we have every reason to be thankful this season. I'm going to briefly say it and we're going to move on, but I, I have been a very cynical pastor this last year. I've allowed things to get the best of me and I've allowed it to control me. And God in his grace and patience has dealt with me individually. And I just want to let you guys know that although cynicism has been a comfort to me, it's been a false comfort and I'm here to tell you that I'm so thankful and I have such a joy that's found in Christ that I know a lot of you desire deeply. So although weeping may endure for the night for some of you, remember joy does in fact come in the morning. And we see this with the Ruth, guys. What an example we see with Ruth. Because guess what? She's going to find her husband this chapter. So let us begin. In verse 1 of Ruth chapter 4, we're told this. Now Boaz went up to the gate. He sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he sat down, he came and sat aside him. So notice the location of where Boaz is at. We're told he met at the gate. Now, this isn't like a traditional gate that some of us might think of. This is not like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. They're not hanging out at this gate. A gate, if you will, was the cities, or at least in the ancient world, the city's place where they would conduct city council. They would, it would be a courtroom of, of some sort. It's where all legal matters were settled at this gate, where official business is transacted. And for Boaz, there's some business that needs to be done. As most of you remember from last week, uh, Ruth was instructed by her mother-in-law to go to the threshing floor where Boaz was because the barley harvest was coming to an end. Ruth was instructed to go to Boaz while he was sleeping, remember, uncover his feet, and then basically propose to him. And um, she tells Boaz, you're indeed a close relative. Will you take me under your wing? We learned this last week. And then Boaz responds, as excited as he was, in Ruth chapter 3, verse 12, said, now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there's a relative closer than I. For Boaz, he was so happy that Ruth essentially proposed to him. Um, he, but he knew, because he was an honorable man, he knew that there was someone else that could carry on the responsibility of the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. And this close relative is introduced in this chapter. Except I want you to notice what Boaz says concerning this close relative. Did you notice his name isn't given? Boaz says in verse 1, Come aside, friend, and sit down here. Now, I need you guys to understand, the phrase, come aside, friend, in the ancient Hebrew can literally be translated, and I am not making this up, 
Homicide friend can be translated as Mr. So-and-so. Not make, I'm not making this up. It's be like, you know, for those of you who, who have been guilty of this, when you forget someone's name, hey, buddy, chief, bro, you know who you are. I won't say who, but one of Carolyn's family members used to call me chief all the time when we were dating for like months. And it's like, but the poor guy forgot my name. It's John. No one else in the world is named John. Anyways, we digress. Why is Boaz referring to this kinsman redeemer, the next Goel, as Mr. So-and-so? Now, in a moment, I'm going to explain to you why he did that, but I'm also going to let you know and understand the author of Ruth, which we don't know who it is. I believe it was Samuel. Some agree with that. It's not the point. The author of Ruth was intentional to basically obscure the name of the person. Almost as if the author is saying, like, I know who the person is, but I'm protecting the person by not revealing his name. And like I said, in a moment, you'll see why he's referred to as Mr. So-and-so. For now, Boaz has, has, con- has some business to conduct with him at the gate. And he brings some people with him. Look at verse 2. He took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Again, Boaz has business to conduct. And unlike today, well, no, I shouldn't say unlike today. For Boaz, he's brought legal representation, which we do today. And in this case, it was the elders of the city. But unlike today, when these matters were brought up, At the gate, they were settled quickly. Uh, As most of you know, uh, court cases and hearings can last years. And they can be prolonged and they can be extended. But not in the case of Boaz and what needs to be conducted here. Because look what happens in verse 3. He said to the close relative, that's Mr. So-and-so, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the pieces of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it. I'm next after you. And he said, this is now Mr. So-and-so, I will redeem it. For Mr. So-and-so, he's looking at it as like, Heck yeah, I'll take on this. Hey, yes, I will exercise my right as kinsman redeemer. This is amazing. And thank you, Boaz, for bringing it to my attention. Now, this is crazy because for a lot of us, it's like, Boaz, what are you thinking? What's the strategy here? You love Ruth and you're like just making this like so easy for him. But the fact of the matter is he knew exactly what he was doing. In fact, if you look closely at verse 4, did you notice Ruth is not mentioned. Property is only the transaction here that's being established. I wanted to inform you, same, uh, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants of the elders of my people. If you redeem it, redeem it. But if you won't redeem it, then tell me that I might know, and there's no one but you who can redeem it. I'm next after you. And so, of course, for Mr. So-and-so, it's like, uh, yes, yes, I will gladly redeem it. But, but Ruth is not mentioned once. He only agrees to it contingent in the context of property. So for him, it's like, uh, yeah, uh, I have my property portfolio growing, and this is great news for me. But the moment he's going to find out that it's from Ruth, his, his tune is going to change quickly, which is why Boaz's strategy is falling into place. Now you're going to see Boaz. He's, guys, he's a hustler right here, because look what happens in verse 5. Then Boaz said, as he's celebrating with him, okay, on the day you buy the field from the land, as the elders of the city are saying, congratulations, Mr. So-and-so, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Oh, snap, Mr. So-and-so just got hustled. Like, wait, what? There's someone else involved in this process. And you'll see what I mean. He knows he got hustled because look at verse 6 in his response once he finds out Ruth is involved. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of my redemption for yourself for I cannot redeem it. 
Yeah, so Mr. So-and-so was quick to agree to this the moment it was property, physical land, but the moment he realizes that Ruth is involved, he's, oh, okay, so now I'm obligated to have children with this woman. And now I'm obligated to restore what was Elimelech's in the name of Elimelech. And not only that, I need to purchase the land and whatever was owed in this, in this property. Because now it's more complicated for Mr. So-and-so because it's not just as simple as taking Ruth. Now, if I take on Ruth, then I have to split my inheritance with my current children and the sons of Ruth that we're going to have together. I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin it. I, I think that's actually absolutely true. And for all the wives in the room, um, I think his wife's going to be really mad if he came home with this news. Like, can you imagine Mr. So-and-so going to his wife? Like, she's like, how is the meeting with Boaz at the gate today? He's like, well, it's interesting you brought that up. Um, the pitch was good. In fact, so good. Uh, you have a new sister wife now and you're welcome. Like, she would be like, what, what are you talking about? What, what's happening here? Quick to agree to the property, even quick, more quick to disagree the moment he found out Ruth was involved. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I can't do it. Oh, sneaky, sneaky Boaz. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I hope you're seeing now why the writer was quick to refer to him as Mr. So-and-so. Because you're going to find out, we're going to read from Deuteronomy here momentarily. But it was in the Jewish mind's and the culture, disgraceful not to take on the responsibility as kinsman redeemer. Like he reserves the right to say no, but in the writer's mind, he's protecting the person because like to do something like this, it's kind of shady. But for Boaz, this is the, the best news ever. In fact, you're going to notice the word redeem. Redeemer is a mentioned a good nine times in verses four through six alone. So that tells me this is important enough that we should discuss it for a second. In fact, that word redeem literally means to set free by paying a price. In the case of Naomi and Ruth uh, and their property, their property was either sold when they went to Moab or it was under some kind of mortgage. The property belonged to Naomi and Ruth, but the problem was they were so poor they couldn't afford the property. They couldn't pay the mortgage, and so therefore they couldn't redeem it on their own. They needed a close relative, a kinsman redeemer to pay the price for them. I hope you see where I'm about to go with this. The spiritual significance when we're looking at this, because there's so many typologies and pictures that parallel with us being Ruth and Boaz being Jesus. Because when you think about the, the spiritual significance behind this, for each person in this room who is hearing my voice, your spiritual redemption, you cannot pay it on your own. You can't. You can attempt to do it. But the reality is we are unable, we are literally unable to set ourselves free from the issue of sin. You can't pay it off through self-righteousness, like I'm a good person. You can't, you can't even pay off being set free in God's mind through traditionalism. Oh, I go to church, I give to church. You know, you have these things that are practices, but they're not what seal and make you saved. And so these are things that are not adequate to redeem you and I ever. And yet we're living in a time where people believe the, the quite the opposite. That like actually coming to church, I'm more favored in God's eyes. Um, me being a good person pays the price for my salvation. But that's not biblical, guys. It has nothing to do with you. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Well, how were we bought? Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him, we have redemption. You are set free, how? Through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, through his blood, meaning at his death at the cross. You're set free. You were bought at the cross of Calvary, which tells me if we were bought, then our sin has a hold of, on our life. And like any ransom, if the debt is not paid, the result, according to the Bible, is death. Check this out. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin 
It's death. But the, three, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And I'm hearing that, and some of you know that verse, but I need to remind you of that truth. The moment you respond to the gospel and you, under, you got it, it made sense. It was as if Jesus was looking at you and saying, I'll pay the price. I'll pay your debt right now in full, completely. I'm going to die for you because you're worth it, because I love you. Jesus and Jesus alone is the only one that can set us free. John 8, 36. Therefore, if the Son of Man makes you free, you shall be free indeed. What an amazing promise. What an amazing... You, guys, if you place your trust in Christ, that through faith you believe he died for your sins... And that he rose from the grave three days later, later, proving he was God. It's by faith you're saved. It has nothing to do with you. It's not like, well, I believed harder than the person to the left of me. I'm more saved than the person behind me. That's not how it works. You can't boast in this gift because it is that. It's free. And it's the very thing that sets you free. It pays your debt in full. That's why Christ becomes enough. And when you think about that in the context, think about that in the context of money in general. If someone came up to you right now and said, hey, I know you have student debt. I know you have a mortgage. I know you have credit card debt. I'm going to pay it all off right now. Like for a lot of us, it's like, that's outrageous. That would never happen. It, that would never happen. And yet in Christ's eyes, the debt you've acquired, and maybe some of you are like, I got a big list. My past is heavy, John. It doesn't matter because for Jesus, he looks at it as, I'm going to set you free. And I want to set you free. And I look at that from my life because maybe that's easy for some of you. Some of you are like, I'm debt free financially. Some of you are like, I have minimal debt. And some of you are like, I'm drowning in debt. But in God's eyes, through the, the parallel of sin, they're all the same. They're separating us from Christ. And when I think about that for my own life, it's like, why would you do that for me, Jesus? I was a compulsive liar. I was dealing with depression and self-mutilation. Early age of being promiscuous. I just had a self-destructive lifestyle. And I, was, and I was blatantly against pleasing God. Why would you still want to die for me? Even for you guys. Like, why would he do it? Why would he ever do that? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is, is in Romans 5, 8. Why would he do that for you? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, this is where this is confusing for us because we love people on the basis of what? How they love us. You are nice to me, I'll be nice to you. It's quite simple, Mr. You know, Sarcastic McGee. Hey, you're mean to me, I'm going to be mean to you. It is natural for us to show love to people contingent on how they love us. And it's easy to hate people that hate us. But that's not the case with Christ. Even when you were directly disobeying God, he's going to say, I'm still going to die for you. Even when you run from me for years, I'm still going to die for you. Even when you think that you can never be saved and that what you've done is too far and too bad, I'm still going to die for you. We serve an amazing God that loves us not on the basis of what he gets in return. That's agape love in and of itself. And, and I, I think about that. Jesus and Jesus alone becomes the only one that can save us from the problem of sin. And here in Ruth chapter 4, this close relative, Mr. So-and-so, has the opportunity to be the one to redeem this family, pay off their debt, and yet he couldn't agree to it. I can't do it. It's going to ruin me. But with Boaz, we're going to see that not only is he motivated, he's motivated by love. Because here's the thing. Think about this even culturally. She's from the land of Moab. Why would he redeem this person when the children of Israel were forbidden to associate with these people? This is where an amazing picture is going to come because a lot of us are like, why do we not obey the law anymore? Because the law was never meant to save you. It was meant to reveal your sin. Only Jesus can save you. And for whatever reason, through the Holy Spirit, Boaz agrees to this. And he didn't have to, guys. He was motivated by love. And again, this becomes another type and picture of Jesus. Boaz, I, I, I'm Boaz. I am willing to pay the price. 
I'm willing to take on all of the responsibility. That's why I'm saying, man, imagine if someone said that to you about your debt, your financial debt. I'll take it all. I'll pay it right now. It seems near to impossible. And yet for Jesus, he's saying, I'll take on your spiritual debt, your sin. I'm willing to take it all. I'm willing to do it. That's why this gift, we would never accept. A lot of us, when we would think about this financially, we, we, we can never accept that from us. I can't accept this gift. Well, you did nothing to earn it, but I want to give it. And for Jesus, it's like, Jesus, but I didn't earn it. How, how can I earn your favor? And Jesus is like, believe in me, trust in me, place your faith in me. That's it. When you think about the weight of debt Jesus was willing to take, not just for you personally. Man, you look at your own life and you're like, I got a heavy life. Jesus is taking on the price for every person who has ever been born. And for Boaz, he becomes this type. I'm willing to do it. So look what happens in verse 7 and 8. Now, this was the custom in the former times in, in Israel <laughs> concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, yes, you're reading this correctly, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he took off his sandal. Yep. So we're going to talk about this first for a moment. Like we're reading this and we're like, uh, Pastor John, why are they doing this? I don't know. Let's move on. No, I'm, you know why? The answer lies in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy gives this outline in the event the go well the kinsman redeemer, what he, how he is supposed to be treated in the event he declines the offer of being the kinsman redeemer. It's a, it's a hilarious law. Deuteronomy 25, 7 through 9. Here's the outline. You ready? But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders, that's what we're reading right now, and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother, verse 8. Then the elders of the city shall call and speak to him, but if he stands firm and says, I don't want to take her, <laughs> then the brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, so it shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. Like, like I feel like I've seen this at sports games or something. Just like, dude. But like, like, first of all, keep in mind, when you read these laws in Deuteronomy, they had to establish it for a reason. And they had to show the children of Israel, like, okay, obviously this didn't go the way that it was supposed to. And for Moses, I just imagine he's petting this. Like, okay, tell me what happened. I asked to marry, if he would marry me. He refused. What do we do? All right. Make him take off his sandal. Okay, then what? And then spit in his face. That's it? That's it. Let's, let's, we're going to put it in writing. It's going to be official. But that's what I'm saying. Jewish culture, it was, it was disgraceful. It was appalling if a kinsman redeemer declined this offer. It would be like if someone came to your house and brought a child and said, I need you to watch this child. Take care of this child. No one else can. And you said, uh, we're having dinner right now, and we can't take this child. Thank you very much. Even if you went through the process of trying to find a home for that child, in their mind, they're looking at it as you, you have the opportunity to serve and take care of this family, to continue the family name so it doesn't die with Elimelech. And yet at the same time, he reserved the right to do it. So... He declines, he takes off his sandal, and he passes it. But did you notice in the text, Ruth doesn't spit in his face? Hmm, why? Now, this is conjecture, meaning this is the position I'm holding. The Deuteronomy law required that she take it off his foot and then begin the process to spit in his face. In my opinion, by him taking it off, it was almost like a sign of grace that they're willing to go through with this transaction. Meaning Boaz isn't mad that he's declining it. He's happy. This is great news for Boaz. This is great news for Ruth and Naomi. It's great for Mr. So-and-so and especially his wife. Like this is great news across the board. And now the transaction is, in, is, is complete. 
And now a declaration is made. Look at verse 9 and 10. Boaz said to the elders of the people, Your witnesses, witnesses this day that I have brought all, bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's, Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, because now the, the transaction is being finalized, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses of this day. Now, this is another amazing typology of Jesus. Notice again, he's willing to take on the name. Did you just notice the wording? So that the, so that the name of the dead through his inheritance and that the name of the dead may not be cut off. I am willing to take on the debt so that the family name can continue. And you're witnesses of this. And for Jesus, he does the same thing. You read Ephesians chapter 2. It says you were once afar. You were once cut off. You and I had death and condemnation to look forward to. And for Jesus, he's saying, you were cut off from me, but I've made a way for you to not be cut off. And you know what the witness is of that? His death at the cross and his resurrection. And for Boaz, guys, you got to know, he is so happy to publicly declare this. And that's why it's just so noteworthy because in his mind, he knew this was the right way to do it. Remember we talked about it last week? You know, for Ruth, she's like, take me under your wing. You're my close relative. And he could have been like, you're right, but we can't tell the other guy because he's technically closer. And let's just not tell. And he doesn't do that. He does it the right way. He's now publicly honoring God. Uh, Mr. So-and-so is certainly thankful, but he did it in such a way to show the community that God is worth it. And this is something that's very difficult in our culture right now. We're honoring God publicly. It's a rare thing. And then it made me think about just wedding ceremonies in general. When I, when I was on staff here before becoming the lead pastor, I was an assistant pastor, and I performed all of the premarital counselings here at the church. And if you wanted to get married, you'd come to see me, and we'd go through a seven to nine-week program to talk about what marriage is. And I remember there's this one couple, I will never forget this couple, guys, the rest of my life, Frank and Nadine, they came to, the, to get premarital counseling, recommend, recommended by her mom. And I'm getting to know them, and I had them fill out the questionnaire, and I realized these guys aren't Christians. They're just here because their mom made them come. And I'm like, oh, well, that kind of defeats the purpose of premarital because I'm teaching them what God's word says, and they don't even know God. And then the Lord was like, so give them the gospel. Okay. There's a thought, Lord. They had, they were in their early 20s and they had a, like a two, three-year-old little girl with them. And I start explaining to them who Jesus is and the power of the gospel. And they start crying. And then I ask the question, do you guys want to give your life to Jesus? And they agree to it. They're so happy. that they're, they, they give their life to Jesus. They wanted to have their wedding scheduled eight months from that date. And he says, I want to do this the right way because we're living together. What do we do? I'm like, I got it. Today's Thursday. You're a dad. You have a responsibility to this little girl. And I get that. But you know what? Stay at a buddy's house today and tomorrow and come to the church Saturday. Let's do an informal wedding ceremony. Just bring a couple people, I'll perform the wedding, and then in eight months we'll have the formal ceremony. But just bring a couple people. So they show up here at the church that Saturday. They brought 45 people with them. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think you guys understand what the word a couple people. And they're like, no, no, no. You need to tell them what you told us in your office about Jesus. Tell, tell, tell them about Jesus the way you told us. And I was, I was so, I couldn't believe it because I was just looking at these guys. They're so excited for people to know who Christ is. And then I asked permission to do it. I've, ne I've performed so many ceremonies, but this was the only one. And I got their permission to start it off like this. Mawed. Mawed is what brings us together today. It was great because then I was fired for a week and then I was brought back on. No, um. Performed the wedding, they got married, signed the marriage certificate. Eight months later, they were still just as excited. They had more people at the wedding, 
And they're like, okay, this is another opportunity for you to share the gospel with them also. I was so amazed by it because I wasn't like, can I share the gospel at your ceremony? They're like, you need to tell everyone the good news about Jesus. And I was thinking about this in general just for, for how weddings are done. The transformation that's done, it's a type and picture of Christ and his relationship with the bride, the church, this public declaration that you're willing to have before people. And it's the same even as Christians. It's a type and a picture with our relationship with Jesus. Listen to this, Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men... Him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Verse 33, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny it before my Father who is in heaven. Guys, like a marriage, Christianity should be publicly declared for anyone and everyone to see. And for Boaz, he's making this public declaration. You are my witnesses to this day that I'm willing to take on being the kinsman redeemer. Verse 11, look what he says or how the people respond. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we're witnesses that the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrath and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, this is an important factor because they're not just like, okay, they make this declaration. We are witnesses to what is happening today. Now, again, for a lot of you, when you go to a wedding ceremony, you think, okay, Mr. Preacher, let's speed it up because we got some dancing and cake to eat, all right? But what I always tell people at wedding ceremonies, that these two are making a public declaration of their love to one another, right? In sickness and health, good times, bad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with you. And these people are witnesses to that. But what I like to tell people at ceremonies is you guys Let's keep this couple accountable. So when things are hard, you can say, I was at your wedding that day. And you made a vow to each other in sickness and health that you're going to stick it through. And it seems kind of like that's a lot of pressure on me, John. I'm not the pastor. I, to me, guys, if we're witnesses to a union, then God has called us to make sure that when things are hard and they want to separate that union, that you say, is there any way that, we can, that you can fight for this? Because marriage is a fight, guys. I've been in people's weddings, and they're separated, and it was so ugly, the things that happened. And I, they're, they're screening my calls. They're not wanting to answer me. And then I have to go to their house when they know I'm not showing up and beg them to go back to their wife. Fight for your marriage. You asked me to be in your wedding, and I'm here begging you to fight for your marriage. And I, and I just want to say this. I get we have widows in this church. We have divorced people in this church. You're, some of you are in a marriage right now and you're like thinking about it. Like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Fighting for a marriage is not acquired in 10 years, 20 years. You fight for it daily. And for a lot of you, you need to hear, and I don't know the story. And you're right, I don't know the story. And for some of you, maybe there was a severing that happened because of, of your spouse was not faithful to you. And man, what a hard thing that you have to go through. But man, what a redeeming God we serve that wants to use the years that the locusts ate away to redeem it for good. And I'm here to tell you, as the pastor, that I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, your marriage is worth fighting for. And I don't know what the story is, and I'm not using this as a ploy and the next thing to be. So if you need marriage counseling afterwards, come and see me. If you need marriage counseling, you fill out an application. Let's begin that process. But the point is still the same. A wedding ceremony is a celebration, but witnesses are presented as a way to keep the couple accountable. Remember that the next time you go to a wedding. Because I want you to notice, as these witnesses make this public declaration, they pray something over Ruth. Did you notice? May the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, who built the house of Israel. May you prosper in Ephrath and become famous in Bethlehem. Now, FYI, between Rachel and and Leah, they had 13 kids. Which, you know, for Ruth, she's got to be there like, um, whoa, 
right? Like, I understand that pressure. And this is like our culture standards. When you see a couple and it's like, you guys like each other, when's the wedding? And then they get married. It's like, I know you're married now, but when's the kid? And then they have a kid. And it's like, <laughs> when are you having another kid? See, like, I get this because my wife was the oldest of eight kids. And people always ask in our first years of marriage, so you're going to have eight kids like your mother-in-law? No, I will not. And like I've told people once, and I'll tell you guys again publicly, three is a good odd number in my household. (laughs) What's the point of this, John? I don't know, but let's move on. They're praying over Ruth that she would have tons of kids. And this is a good thing. Not only that, verse 12, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, and because of the offspring which the Lord will give you for from this young woman. Now, this, the thing about the Perez family, which is very important, is that surprisingly enough, uh, Boaz is a descendant from this family. As we get to the very end of the chapter, you're going to see the genealogy of why this is all not a coincidence that God, before time began, knew that this family was going to be brought together. But the, the, here's the point. They're praying this prayer so that they would be fruitful in their childbearing. Unlike today, or a lot of people, I should say, in our culture, for Israel at this time, man, they valued kids. Kids are a gift from God. And yet we're living in a time that children are not treated as gifts, but as an inconvenience to the life's goals. I just want to say this briefly and we'll move on. I don't want to be insensitive to this issue. It's different for every couple. Some of you had kids right away. Some of you waited a while. And some of you are still, you're trying to have kids right now. And I I want to encourage you that God opens and closes the womb. I believe that. But I also believe, and just to encourage you, contrary to cultural approach when it comes to kids. They are a gift from God and everything that has ever been provided for my kids has been provided for because of God. You know what happens when you get married? You realize how self-centered you are. You know what happens when you have a kid? You really see how self-centered you are. And it's such a beautiful thing because I just want to say, and we're going to move on. Marriage is not about just fulfillment for yourself. Your marriage exists to serve your spouse, to love them and to serve them. It's not, I'm trying to get brownie points with my spouse so they see that I'm a good person. Your job is to serve them in a way that reflects that Christ is your God and King. And it's the same when you have kids. So here's the point. Here's the point. We're going to move on. They're praying over this family to have lots of kids be fruitful in their childbearing. And then look what happens in verse 13. So Boaz, after this prayer is made, took Ruth and she became his wife. And when, it, when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Verse 14. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And, and may his name be famous in all of Israel. Now, this is interesting because It's been Ruth and Boaz, Ruth and Boaz. Everything is Ruth and Boaz. And all of a sudden, Naomi is brought into the picture and has all the attention. And I'm pointing this out because remember, when she entered Bethlehem, they're announcing her arrival. Look, Naomi has returned. And remember what she said? Don't call me Naomi because the name meant pleasant. Call me Mara because that name means bitterness. And she makes this declaration as, as she says, like, don't call me that, call me Mara. She said, she does, you know, call me this because the Lord has dealt harshly with me. And yet here in verse 14 of the fourth chapter of Ruth, you know, it begins with weeping. She's bitter. But here in the fourth chapter, she said, the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. Naomi realized her foolishness to doubt God's faithfulness. Oh man, how many of us have been guilty of that? Where you go through a season and you're just like, I don't know if God's going to come through with this. I just don't know. I don't think he is. And maybe for some of you, that season lasted like months for some years. And then God does go through with it. And it's almost like the Lord is showing, not only was I faithful then, I'm faithful today. I haven't left you. And for me, that's been, guys, I have been such a cynical pastor this last two years. 
for things that are so silly. And, and, and I've, I've gone through these moments where the Lord has been showing me not only his goodness, but that, you know, isn't it odd how we cling to discomfort and anger? Like it's going to bring something to us. And I'm here to tell you, it's, it, it, is a, it is going to hold you down from the promises of what God wants to reveal to you. The Lord this last month has shown me not only that he is good, but that, the, man, I've just been a cynical pastor, guys. That me, you know, just being just so foolish has just been showing God's faithfulness even more. For, for Naomi, God never left her. Why would you even think that, Naomi? God's provided this much, so much. And maybe for that's, for this, you need to hear that right now. That God hasn't left you, even though you feel abandoned in your marriage right now, in your finances, in your kids. Like, we have all these reasons to understand why is God doing it this way. But he has never left you. In fact, Moses, when he was giving instruction to the people of Israel, listen to this, Deuteronomy 31.8. Do not be afraid or discouraged, because we easily can be. For the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. And guys, that is the same thing for you. Cling to the promises of God. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Resist the devil and he flees from you. God's not done with you yet. He hasn't left you yet. And for Naomi, she's not alone. God never left her. Even when she hears those words, look what happens in verse 15 and 16. And may he also be to you a restorer of life and a nurturer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons. And that's a huge statement for that time, by the way. Has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Oh, bitter Naomi is now blessed Naomi. Not only, guys, again, weeping came in the morning for her. But now joy is, or weeping came in the night for her. But now the morning is here. Ruth is married to Boaz. They've had a kid. Oh, joy. Joy is now reintroduced to her life. She has a grandson. She's famous in all of Israel, even to this day. Even the genealogy is written in Matthew. She's famous all throughout Bethlehem. And not only that, she gets to be the nurse to her own grandson. We're seeing the fruit of this woman and her faithfulness to trust in God in a season that was very hard. And the fruit is now shown in the, in the final verses. Read it with me. Verses 17 through 22. Also the neighbor gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called uh, his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez be, uh, begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot uh, Abinadab, Abinadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. The, all, some of you might be looking at this, it's kind of like looking at a family album, and it's like, and this is my great, great, great grandfather, and this was his father, and you're like, what's the point to all this? The point to this, and the reason why it's so valuable for us today is when you consider even the picture that Elimelech and Naomi leave Bethlehem because they thought God was not going to provide during the famine. They return back to Bethlehem, find a husband, and then the, Boaz and Ruth have a son in Bethlehem, and David is going to come from Bethlehem, and we're going to see that Joseph and Mary... And you can read this in Luke chapter 2. They're going to register a census of Augustus that is recorded as they make their way to Bethlehem. All of this is happening because Ruth and Boaz were faithful to trust in God. And we're going to see prophetically, this isn't just a coincidence, this was prophetically seen before time began that this family had to meet. And that's why every person, you're hearing my voice as we're about to come to a close, you benefit from this genealogy because Jesus Christ is going to come through this family line. And not only that, when you look at this from eternity, before you and I were ever even brought into the earth, Jesus 
was on the forefront, and God knew that Jesus was going to come through this family. I want to invite the worship team to come up, but I want to give you with this final thought. In the 1700s, a term was coined, and they lived happily ever after. Contrary to what most of you might think, no, Disney did not coin that term. And a lot of times it's easy to look at these kinds of stories almost with eyes of jealousy. Why can't I have a marriage like that? Why can't I have my happily ever after? And we do this with each other. We look at each other's lives. Why can they have it all together, but I can't? Why can't my husband love me the way that husband loves her? Or why can't my wife love me and respect me the way? And, and you know what? I just, I want to bring you to reality right now, okay? Like I said before, marriage is a fight. And contrary to what most people think to this romanticized glamour, glamorification of cinema, that this is what a relationship looks like, I'm here to tell you that a relationship is outlined through what the Bible shows us. And like I said before, your happily ever after isn't contingent on the person and how they treat you. It's how you serve the person. Serve your wife, guys. Love her, man. Love her the way God's called you to love her. Ladies, love your, your husbands. Be there and your loyalty is to the Lord and show him that he's worth fighting for. Those of you who are single, guys, God is worth waiting for that person to come into your life. I cannot even begin to tell you that my happily ever after isn't contingent on the right choices I made. It's because God, before eternity began, knew that this family was going to come together. And my relationship is now established and stamped. I have eternity to look forward to because of Jesus. And because of that, I get to serve my wife the way God's called me to serve her. This is a season not of eyebrowing you, browbeating you with how to do this right. It's to look at this right now. Instead of just feeling bad for yourself, it's time to step up and serve one another again. Not prove a point. Oh, if I'm nice, then they'll be nice to me. Just love a man. And watch the Lord use that in sustaining. Ooh.